Music Academy of the West here in Santa Barbara. Um, today's panel is about the zeitgeist, programming the zeitgeist, art as a response to social and cultural issues, something that's very near and dear to many of our hearts. Um, I would love to welcome this esteemed group of panelists, Elena Park, curator and producer of many amazing projects, which I hope she'll talk about. Gabriela Alina Frank, who is a, a very, very accomplished composer, actually writing something for Music Academy of the West this summer, no? Or having something performed, and Christy Edmonds from UCLA. Um, looking forward to hearing what you all have to say, and um, thanks, enjoy. Thank you, Jessica, and thanks to Scott and everyone for having us um, be part of your first conference. Um, I was very glad that this topic was being programmed as part of Evolution Revolution um, because sometimes I think classical music can seem to be removed from kind of contemporary issues and contemporary society and not uh, feel as much of a necessity to kind of reflect kind of social, political, cultural topics of the day. So I thought it would be great to have a conversation with these two um, who come from very different backgrounds. Um, but I find that both have been deeply involved and engaged in community and social practice and um, artists and ideas in very new and unusual ways in their, in their very different um, paths of work. So just starting with Gabriella, um, you have, you talked to me a lot um, about some of the work you did very mm. early on where you immediately went out into the community in um, very um, unusual and active ways early on, it had, having to do also with your father's background as a Peace Corps volunteer. So can you talk a little bit about the things that you've done separate from your life as a composer? Yeah, I mean, uh, I wouldn't be here except for a civic initiative. The fact that my father was one of the first Peace Corps volunteer when Kennedy started this program in the 60s. And as a World War II baby, born to a Jewish family from the Bronx, and with the family doing well, they went to New Rochelle, and when they retired, they went to Florida. I mean, I know Jewish New York culture very well. Many of the first volunteers in the history of the program were Jews, born in the 40s, that were uh, imbued with the sense of urgency that the world was a dangerous place and they needed to participate and make it a safer place. So the idea of the program, and it hasn't shifted that much in many ways, is that young Americans go abroad for two year stints, they don't choose where they go, and they do something to make the economy better or to make uh, issues of sanitation better. And my father was stationed in the beautiful and small nation of Peru and met a coastal baby, that's my mom and she herself of mixed race, of Indian heritage, as in descended from the Incas, Chinese. And my great-grandfather, Po Siong Kam, came from the Cantonese region of China, came down to Peru in the multiple waves that were coming, first with the gold rush, then the railroads, then economic opportunities, and, and uh, Spanish. And so she was a mix of different heritage. And they fell in love, and they were so young, when I think about this, and came to Berkeley in the 60s. So you can imagine, you know, uh, the kind of uh, spirit that was always in my household. And my father is a Mark Twain scholar, and even his championing of a great American writer like Twain, who was the first to use American vernacular, the way ordinary people spoke instead of British rhetoric, in his literature, there's something of advocacy in that, of what the American identity is. My mother had no opportunities as a poor, uh, mixed race, mestiza woman in Peru in the 40s and 50s, and she was able to become a very active stained glass artist. And so I grew up, you know, my brother's a neuroscientist who did his work at Stanford, with this sense of whatever we did, it had to have some sort of relevance beyond the industry of whatever it was. So my father felt that way about literature, my mom felt that way about art, my brother very much feels that way about science. And so for me, it was odd to see the other way around when I got introduced to the music world, and I saw people that didn't leave the practice rooms. I loved it, too. To me, there's something so wonderfully nerdy about it. You know, you can really go deep and for these magical few years of an undergrad career or graduate studies to just focus. All you're trying to do is get that shift just perfect, and you're trying to tell the story. But I also wanted it to be beyond the hedges, that we would say. 
So um, what you're alluding to is at first I was doing a lot of different kinds of volunteer activities that were just made available to us on campus. So different organizations in the city of Houston when I was the undergrad at Rice University at the Shepherd School of Music would come and say, we need ESL tutors, can you speak Spanish? Okay, so I would help with that. Or the Casa Juan Refuge Center needs some volunteers to help refugees feel more welcome. We need somebody to man the rape crisis hotline. So I just did these things. And they ostensibly didn't have anything to do with music, but it was my first way of navigating how do I make time. Every hour away from the practice room is an, is an hour away from the practice room. And my first reaction was a slightly defensive crouch I would take, which is I'm not gonna tell anybody because I want my teachers to still take me seriously. And I found out later that actually a lot of them respected me. They said, that's amazing. I never would have guessed that there was time away. You still produced, you still grew like a weed. And it actually ended up shaping my voice. It gave me courage to write music. I, I'm a composer by trade. To write music that draws on my mother's heritage. And I weld it to all the classical sounds that I, I deeply love. So it was a slow process. It was a very humble process. All I did was say I'd be an ES ESL tutor, and that started me. So it doesn't have to look dramatic. Sometimes when in, you're in school and you're looking at these amazing projects, whether it's an opera that's on a, a socially conscious subject, you don't even know how that happens. But if you were to backtrack and look at all the chapters of the story leading up to it, the first one was just signing up for an ESL class many years earlier. It's really small like that, but you just have to get started on something that's doable and learn the little tricks of how to become better at practicing, more efficient, how to protect your time. Do you really need to pull an all-nighter hanging out with your friends? Maybe just half a nighter, go to bed at three. You start really negotiating with your time. It's not too complicated. You just have to grab at the things that, that move you. You mentioned that doing these things help you find your voice. And since you are a composer, we, I, we just wanted to share a little clip of your music. Um, I know you didn't start traveling to Peru until you were in graduate school. So can you talk a little bit about kind of the exploration into your own identity and how that informed you as a composer and, and introduce the, the clip, that, the short clip that we're gonna share? Well, it's interesting for me when I'm, I'm uh, sometimes described as an expert of Peruvian music, and all my cousins of Peru would laugh because I'm the gringa that goes down. I'm the, I'm the daughter of the one sister in a family of 13 children that left and married an American. But they like what I'm doing, but it becomes this mission. We gotta go show Gabriela, you know, or show her this style of music, or take her to this club, and I go along joyfully with this. So I didn't start traveling until I was, uh, let's see, 26 years old was my first trip. My Spanish wasn't great. I spoke no Indian whatsoever. We didn't have money in my family. And we were um, a scholarly and artistic family, but uh, you know, we didn't have a, a lot of money. So when I started getting money, it was in grad school because the Spanish department and women's studies department had little fellowships that would send people out. And I was the musician applying for everything. There were, I mean, no other musicians. I was the cool one, because I could come back and play some music. So they were very humble trips, and I got sick from the food, and I got mugged, and I got lost, and I got sunburned, and I was homesick, and, and I kept going back. There was something over the years. Now I speak Spanish very well. I can read Indian. I've been to ba every major part of Peru. Or, I mean, I, I'm pretty seasoned. So my music started to change in grad school. And I was also picking up on what I heard of Peruvian music when I was a child. So Peruvian music was already in my diet, alongside my Clementi and my little Haydn and Bach pieces at the piano with my neighborhood piano teacher, herself a South African refugee, a soft-spoken Africana woman. I mean, this is Berkeley. Um, I was also going to Peruvian and Bolivian music concerts because in the 70s, 80s, there was so much turmoil in Latin America. You had the fallout between Allende and Pinochet or you had La Guerra Sucia, the dirty war in Argentina. In Peru, my mom's country in the 80s, the Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path, was a Maoist-centered terrorist group that was tearing apart this tiny country, which is why my mother didn't go back for, for many years. So, but musicians would come out, and so I heard this music, and I would see other people, they didn't look Mexicano, they looked Peruano, they looked Chinese and Indian like my mom. And I saw her get very happy, and there were juice and cookies at the intermission. I mean, the whole thing was festive. 
And so I would come home, and if I saw charango guitars, these little marvelous ukulele type guitars with the body of an armadillo, it's very Andean. If I saw how that was played, I would come back to the piano and I would try and do the same thing. And, and now this is my profession. You know, I haven't changed anything. I just get paid for it. I'm 45 years old almost now. I've been doing it all this time. So my music started to shift, and what you're going to hear is something that came out of um, finding these connections within the classical idiom for a number of years. This is from only about three years ago. After all the traveling I had done and all the wonderful connections that I've made over many years with string players, hardcore classical string quartet players. In a previous life, I think I was a string quartet player. I have string quartet envy. I love this life. I, all my coaches for chamber music, I'm a pianist, uh, were all string players, and I was always envious. I couldn't talk about the string issues you know, with them. But in this that you're going to see, I have three colleagues from Ecuador who play native pan pipes working with a classical string quartet. And I wrote music trying to figure out some sort of ambassadorship within the music that could occur. If I can figure out what they can share, where they can learn from each other in something that is a true fusion. So we're here, just a short clip from Tarqueada. A tarca is a type of flute you will see in Peruvian music. It's, uh, and Tarqueada is a whole bunch of them, and it's also a mood. It's something that's um, active and just moves forward. Can you help me? Gabriella um, has been featured um, in a PBS series of documentaries, um, which, are, which are worth um, watching. One of them takes you to Ecuador, encountering these musicians, and the other one um, shows the collaboration um, that that clip is from when she brought back um, the musicians and, and um, they created this piece. Um, where was that performance from? So this was done at my other alma mater, the University of Michigan, oh, okay. Ann Arbor. And so universities, the schools that you go to can be a great cultivation ground for more than what you think. There's your immediate training. You go out in the world for a little while, and then I come back and I say, I have this great project. And I go back to all the departments that gave me money to send me to Peru 15 years earlier, and I say, now I want to take it to the next level. And universities often have laboratories that they set up that are interdisciplinary. And um, we are able to get funding and to get visa help, things that were beyond me and knowing how to, to manage. We were able to uh, get PBS to back it, and they have a wonderful documentary. Uh, they even gave us a whole hour of time rather than a normal 30-minute allotment for human interest pieces because I wanted to profile as much music making as possible. So almost the entire final concert that we did at the University of Michigan is profiled. For people to hear this, it's, it's, you can describe it, it's exciting when you hear the idea of world meeting. But then you've got to hear the music and, and to see them blow it into these interesting looking instruments. So um, Michigan, Michigan made this possible. Michigan's a great uh, place for interesting work and unusual risk taking, um, which brings us to Christy, um, whose work I had heard about for years uh, in Melbourne at the Park Avenue Armory, and now she's been at um, Cap U CLA for almost six years. And I guess I want to start with kind of a big picture question about 
what it is you're trying to do in, in this, with your work at CAP UCLA and for culture and artists just like writ large? Well, the Center for the Art of Performance uh, at UCLA takes advantage, I would say, in some of what you're describing, of making sure that the tributaries across different ways of knowing and different kinds of thinking and different kinds of forms, research, so on and so forth, that the contemporary practitioners, whether they're in you know, dance and choreography, whether they're in music making, whether they're in uh, theater, literary, visual art, et cetera, et cetera, my job is really to try and find the ways to keep those tributaries very open so that the discovery of new knowledge is actually part of what an artist is able to offer into a culture and community uh, and, and not in an isolated way, as well as how do we support then the sparking of different kinds of ideas where you harness points of inspiration and bring that with an artist to find form and then facilitate that for a public, frankly. So in a way, you know, we think of maybe, for those of you from LA, you would know that UCLA has the Hammer Art Museum, um, the Fowler Art Museum. So the Hammer Art Museum is what contemporary visual art practice perhaps is in a research environment and a public environment. And the Fowler would be World Heritage Collections, contemporary and quite ancient, and what that is for scholarly research in cultural practices. Uh, for scholarship there as well as a public. And what my job is, is as a curator and artistic director is really to run the center that does that for our most ephemeral forms, the work that exists in live performance, and sustain the work to the highest and best of our capacity and open new ways of knowing for a public nationally, internationally, and certainly in LA and on the campus. How's that? Was that short, <laughs> pithy? Okay. <laughs> Um, the topic that we, um, this panel is called Programming the Zeitgeist. Um, is that something that you feel is your responsibility to do? Well, my job is, uh, when, I, when I really default the most to like, what is my job, it comes to the word curator, and really curer, and to care. So if a zeitgeist is happening, and there is a ton of artistic energy moving in these various directions, then my ability to pay as much exquisite attention as I can to the deep listening of seeing what that is for these artists is to then pull it forward and put the apparatus around it that helps in the support and the giving, I would say, of the highest of their integrity with an idea they're pursuing. So I work with contemporary artists and that really does mean that there's a ton of exploration, experimentation, authentic, deep conflict and collaboration, seeking other forms um, to offer something new. It's not the pursuit of a known outcome and how it's refined and perfected. It's actually the authoring of an outcome totally unknown with the highest and best of their gesture towards what that can be. So if somebody said to me, you have to, or, or, or do you program the zeitgeist? It's, it's a foreign thought to me. <laughs> Um, what I do is listen to what the artists are engaged in doing and figure out how to give context and, and support and the apparatus of facilitating it across a very wide public. There's also the part of it which has to do with authoring an institution so that the mission and vision of it is not empty rhetoric, but in fact the institution utilizes the words of mission and my job is to make sure that those are constantly imbued with the soulful intent of what those words actually stand for. And sometimes I have to drag a bigger institution, you know, kicking and screaming towards animating those words with meaning and meaningfulness. But when you create the conditions that a vision and a mission is welcoming to the practices of artists, then they want to engage in being present. Sounds like there's a lot of um, risk um, inherent in the way you think and what you do and what UCLA then invests in. Sure. Well, UCLA in part, I have to say. You're part um, of UCLA. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, the investment. Um, yeah, I mean, but I, I also think that, you know, I, we've been operating so much, at least in this country, for quite some time on this idea that there has to be some kind of like almost industrial strength culture 
where a known outcome is perfected and refined. It is uh, repurposed and it creates avenues of more and more belonging, greater and deeper degrees of philanthropy, um, higher and higher points of leverage, and then inevitably a capital campaign, an expansion, and a new, you know what I mean. What I try to do is stay more in the nimble space where it is highly artist-centric. So the risk in that is that you're not always involved in um, uh, promoting, I suppose, name recognition, which often can fuel levels of complacency, I think. Uh, but really, how does one figure out the collaborative ways in which what an artist is most seeking to be in communion, to be in community, to be in dialogue with, how do they represent their love of a stranger? I have to find those strangers, right? And bring that to um, the, the artist's work. And then also help the artist in the mobility of their practice across multiple institutions, nationally and internationally, or organizations, small and large. So that it has an, a, a kind of ability to move through the world as performance necessarily usually has to. Um, so the risk to me is, is really not I, I'm called that a lot, that I take risks. Um, a risk towards the integrity of an artist's persistence of vision, I do not tend to, to conceive of as a risk. I conceive of it as my job in relation to the curatorial, the dimension of care that you put towards it. But I definitely work in a space where there's a lot of competition around, obviously, resources, attention, and a variety of other things. And, and I suppose in that way, again, if we watch that the value of um, discovery in an audience is diminishing in some way, right? That the value of moving towards the unfamiliar, mm. then you have possibly an economic risk, right? But to me what it is is that you have to resuscitate as deeply as you possibly can the way in which discovery becomes the value that allows our culture to stretch and our soul to stretch. And if we hide from those stretches because they're unfamiliar, right, then I think we diminish. Our empathies, our cognitive empathy, our yearning for new knowledge, um, our veracity, our dance between youth and wisdom gets smaller instead of larger as we progress. And so to me, it is about how do you <laughs> literally ensure that the pursuit of the excellence of the possibility of an idea, which is riskier in a way, is um, more advanced through what I try to do with artists and a public and a university and et cetera, et cetera, rather than um, decorating mediocrity so that I can sell it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are certain curators and artists who I think um, embrace risk in what they do all the time, and so it's hard to recognize it as a thing that you do. I think in the last panel, um, Yuval Sharon does that in his work, and uh, Chris Lorway does it in his programming, and I think Alex Poots has done it as well. Um, and I, I had an experience once where I presented a project at APAP where you pitch, sorry, ISPA, where you pitch a project for 10 minutes and then you hope that these international presenters in the room want to invest in it and bring it to their places. And I was struck by this piece, it was a Cambodian cello puppetry piece, that um, everyone wanted to know the budget, the, um, how, where it was gonna be done, and the degree of success it was going to have because of the financial implications. And the people that responded most warmly to this piece were Mark Morris and Anne Bogart, who were presenting their own projects on that day. Anyway, it did get a home in, in New York, but it just taught me the difference between kind of presenters and, and curator producers. Um, but let's dive more deeply into this specific um, topic about art that reflects kind of cultural and social issues. Um, Music Academy of the West just asked me to put together a couple slides. Just give a little snapshot of some of the things that um, I'm aware of that are happening um, in the world, and not just to classical music. It's kind of a springboard um, for a conversation we can have about the types of work that are out there and the kinds of things that artists are thinking about. So just very quickly, um, uh, the internet, um, the world of the internet, has, has been fodder for pieces. Uh, Two Boys, uh, an opera that the Met commissioned, um, 
in co-production with the ENO that Nico Muley and Craig Lucas um, did recently. The source was a music is a music theater piece um, that um, is connected to Chelsea Manning and the WikiLeaks, a very provocative work. Um, Dead Man Walking, which um, has been around now, I think, for 20 years, um, takes on the subject of the death penalty. Um, and just most recently done, was done at Washington Opera, but it's been around the world, and it's actually one of the most produced operas in Europe. Um, Champion is an opera that went up first in St. Louis, and then um, Washington National Opera most recently. It's by the jazz um, composer Terrence Blanchard um, about Emil Griffiths, who was a, a, welter, a gay welterweight uh, boxing champion. Um, the Colorado takes on issues of the environment. It's a documentary um, with music, um, very arresting and beautiful, and the composers are uh, remarkable. Um, group of people who kind of responded to this uh, very striking uh, and alarming imagery in many ways. Um, and there's a piece that's being developed called Banksicol, a Requiem for Cambodia, which takes um, Western instrumentation with smote, which is a funeral singing style from Cambodia and a small group of Cambodian musicians. And it's the first piece that will kind of um, pay tribute to the victims of the Khmer Rouge and the, and the survivors. And the visuals and direction are by an incredible filmmaker named Riti Pan, um, who divides his time between Paris and Phnom Penh and is beloved of um, the French and the Cannes Film Festival. Um, but this is a piece that's now in development. And Similarly, I think this is a piece that Christy knows well, My Lai, um, is a piece that um, Kronos Quartet is uh, creating, and it, it utilizes South African zithers and xylophones, and it's about the US Army pilot, uh, Mark Thompson, and the piece says that it considers the line between duty and conscience. Angel's Bone, which just won the Pulitzer Prize by Du Yun and Royce Vavrek, um, it's a contemporary parable about human trafficking where two angels come down and they're imprisoned by a couple. I haven't seen this piece myself. I've heard a lot about it. And it went up first at Prototype, which is a, a wonderful festival of new music um, that happens every January with uh, Here Art Center and Beth Morrison Productions as is this piece, Thumbprint, which I had the good fortune of seeing um, last week at Red Cat. Um, it's a piece based on um, the incredible tale of this courageous woman, Mukhtar Mai, who, because of a honor of revenge, um, was gang raped in Pakistan. And instead of committing suicide, which is the normal track for um, a woman who's shamed in this way, she fought back and brought her perpetrators to um, trial. They're still free and it still keeps getting appealed. But anyway, she was there last week for the performances and did talk backs with the audience, which was um, very, very moving. Um, Untitled America is a piece by Kyle Abraham, um, put up by um, Alvin Ailey. Um, and it in discusses or explores the impact of the prison system um, on African-American families and the spoken word narrations provided by people who are actually incarcerated. And Grace Notes is a piece by Carrie Mae Weems, the American um, visual artist and now theater maker that explores the role of grace in democracy. Um, a couple clips just from um, uh, National Saw, that's one of the places where I work. Um, some people are taking chamber music pieces like Adolphus Hellstork Songs of Love and Justice and um, putting visuals up that kind of connect to the Black Lives Matter movement. So this is a photo of rich chamber players and the singer Alison Buchanan um, performing those songs, which were actually written in 1992, um, but have a lot of resonance right now. Uh, another piece at National Sawdust was a piece called Requiem for Tuesday that Helga Davis and Devane Tynes um, did that, again, um, it incorporates dance and, and music and ties into um, a lot of the, the deaths at the hands of um, uh, the police recently. And it was done in this very intimate space. Uh, National Sawdust is a new space that opened in October 2015, and it seats um, at the most 150 people. So it's a, a place that does all kinds of music and different kinds of collaborations with um, artists from different fields. Um, and in this uh, series that I work on, one of the things that we explored recently was a thing called Who Owns the Story, where I had a Lakota musician, um, one from the uh, Big Island of Hawaii, theater makers Dale Orlander Smith, um, Carl Hancock Rux, monologist Mike Daisy, and um, the singer-songwriter Morley talk about this ownership of story, which has become a hot-button topic um, because of the Dana Schutz painting of the open casket of Emmett Till, where um, a lot of artists spoke out and said that a Caucasian woman didn't have the right to paint this, um, the, the open casket of this boy who had been murdered in 1955. And it got very heated, and there was a petition 
calling for the burning of the painting. Um, and anyway, we did we do events like that at National Sawdust to really tie into what people are thinking about and responding to, um, because uh, the founder Paola Prestini, who's a composer, is very much an activist and, and um, believes in activism and entrepreneurship as the core of what a composer should be doing. We can talk more about that. And then um, Jessica said, well, you're going to show us a photo of Julius Caesar. So you know, this is what just happened at the public theater, Shakespeare in the Park, where they um, made Julius Caesar a Trump-like character. And um, they lost sponsorship, and there were protests, and there were a lot of um, issues raised around this. There was a version where there was a um, Obama-type figure um, as Julius Caesar a number of years ago, but it didn't arouse such strong passions. But we live in a different time at the moment. So, so that's just a look at some of the, the things, some of the topics that people are taking on um, across genre. Um, one of the things I wonder about is if classical music tends to cede this ground to non-classical music um, artists. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you think that that in your experience is is true, and if it's true, is this is, is this acceptable? Is this something that should be that way? Well, I think uh, if you want to be a pioneer, you have to be very savvy about the medium that you're working in. And do you want results, or do you want to be the sacrificial lamb, the outlier whose work is never done again? And and uh, I mean. Those are very important too. I mean, I think when I look at my work list, I have sacrificial lamb pieces that made a certain kind of statement. They taught me a lot, maybe technically, but also about what kind of impact did I really have after all was said and done. And I operate within largely the classical music world. I have an opera that's coming up. I work with major symphony orchestras. Um, I'm about to become composer in residence with one of the storied, I would say, a top three orchestra here in the country. And they know so, my work. Okay. They know, uh, maybe not, oh, okay. but maybe next week. <laughs> it's soon. Um, but it's, it's a major orchestra that knows my work. And so then they know that I'm probably going to want to do something that's on Latin American idioms. If you look at some of my recent work, I just had a requiem that was premiered by the Houston Symphony, the Conquest Requiem, which is about the Spaniards coming over and conquering the, the Aztecs. And we tell it through the story of one woman's experience, Malinche, who was Cortez's concubine. The piece before that that the DSO, Detroit Symphony Orchestra, did was called Walkabout, about my travels through Peru. But I do pull up subjects that are about heartbreak, about political uh, clashes and, and traumas. And, but yet the music is, is something that speaks to people. If you didn't know what the program was, if you can grab them here first with just the music, they are moved in spite of themselves before they cross the political ground, before that awareness kicks in. And so that's our job as artists, is to know what version of ourselves that we're putting into different environments. You can never be not yourself. Then it's, it's not worth the days of your time and all your gifts to participate in that project. There have been others that I have you know, turned away from. I thought that the risk was too great that the piece would be just exotica in a curio shop. And, um, and it may even on paper look like it could be the same, but there was just something that was distasteful enough to me that I realized I'm not going to be part of this kind of project. It was suggested, it was suggested to you as a particular Sorry, a uh, particular idea that you would execute as a composer? Yeah, somebody, I mean, this has happened a number of times where um, you're the go-to girl for all things Latino. So can you do this? And, or can you do something on Brazilian music? I'm not Brazilian at all. And so I feel like, you know, so you haven't done your homework, not just on me, but on the culture, on the style. So I can't participate. This doesn't further discourse. It's irresponsible for me to think about my career and another commission and money in the bank and working with a renowned performer. Um, ultimately, you know, everything that you were saying, my brain was just firing off because I kept coming to the same conclusion, which is artists have to step up. We have to step up. We have to take that risk also. And we have to figure it out. It's, nobody's going to do it for us. It's incumbent upon us to show how all the Tchaikovsky and all the Sibelius, all the Beethoven that we learn is relevant in this day and age through these stories. 
I'm doing this because I want to be able to say I can sit at the table with Beethoven and Bartok. They spoke to the issues of their day. And if we went and got a beer, could I tell them about Sendero Luminoso? Do I have music that reflects that? And so when you can be that kind of ambassador and you write excellent music and you break it down in this way to a classical symphony or a string quartet, and you, if you're successfully imbuing them with the responsibility, the engine will fuel itself, because the content is really good. So I love seeing all of this, but I, went, I was thinking also of saying, you know, it it's, can be a little bit more challenging within the classical music world, but we artists are the ones that have to step up and, and do that. I had a, you know, I came to music somewhat late, but it was also a very traditional classical conservatory training. I played all the Chopin etudes. I played a lot of the Beethoven sonatas. I wrote my six minute wonder symphony piece as my senior thesis. I did all of that stuff. But I also was doing some of this volunteer work. I was trying to find a larger context. And, um, and I found kindred spirits. I think that's very important in school to not feel that you're weird, to not feel that um, you have to hide if you want to volunteer at a prison, which I did in grad school. And I kept that quiet. But then I was able to bring in people with me because I wasn't alone. So I think politically, when I was in school, the times weren't as obviously tumultuous as they are now. Now you cannot escape it. I think your head is really in the sand if you're training and you're not reading the news. Uh, but this is, your, this, is, this is the youngins' future. And to understand how you're going to be relevant and to um, and to encourage work that speaks to you, but it's, it's important, it's important to do. There's an um, artist who I admire, Mark Bamuti Joseph, um, who works at Europe Buena Center for the Arts, and he talks about you know, bringing the full version of yourself into the room, so not, and you just mentioned music that shows a version of who you are. Do you think that it's really difficult in classical music to show the full version of who you are? You have to be strategic. You know, um, and then you get street cred. So I was able to, because I produce and I produce well, I'm not expensive, you get something. So presenters have to survive. And so they get a lot of bang for their buck. You think about that too. Yet, it's not safe. I'm not trying to pander. I wouldn't want to do that to my audience. I'm not trying to be exotica as well. So, you know, I, I when Houston Symphony said, you know, we'd like to commission you again, so I have a history with them. And the last piece with a, a viola concerto 10 years ago. So after 10 years going out in the water, I come back, and I became their composer in residence, and they said, we'd like to commission you again. I said, my heart started going like this, saying, oh my goodness, okay, they trust me. So can I do a requiem? I said, okay, well, can I, can I do more than 20 minutes? Can you give me 40? Okay, in a big choir. You know, and two soloists, and I brought in two soloists, and my writer, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, Nilo Cruz, and can we do it on this subject in a, in a Trump voting state, you know? And, and they said, okay. But it took me years, and I had proven myself on more doable projects, starting with school, school projects, starting with the means that I had. It starts small, but you can start practicing. Because in the end, it doesn't feel that much different from that senior th thesis that I did. The requiem actually felt just as scary and just as wonderful. It, it qualitatively felt the same, and I was already practicing from the time when I was bringing in charango music to the piano when I was a kid and trying to make that. So it doesn't ever get less scary, but it's, it's just you become more savvy. You do. You're a 45-year-old version of, of yourself when you're 35 or 25 or, or 15, um, and you build up credibility, there's momentum. Can you comment on what her experience has been and, and also comment on the um, kind of your w window into classical music stuff that you end up programming? Well, I'll share a story on it and I think it'll relate, but I mean, getting to it of the classical music, I think that what you said early in that is absolutely spot on. If you're dealing with the canon the Western classical canon of music through classical idioms, then there is the, the, the um, creativity and the pressure and the gift to try and make sure that both the timing and the sequencing are how you carry that forward into the current moment. So th that either it's own politics or it's sublime nature or it's you know athleticism of 
you know, notes, whatever, uh, that, it, that it is foisted forward. I mean, it's the same with Shakespeare, and it's the same with a variety of things in different um, theatrical forms and literary forms. The stories that endure are the ones that we continue to tell. And it's artists who truly engage in the wanting passion to tell and tackle that story, or climb the Mount Everest or the Partitas, or whatever it is that they're doing. And I think that in, in the classical world, rather than the formulaic approach of like, we have to have this, 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 and this over the arc of a year, that sometimes it will, for economic reasons, or fulfillment of appetites in a way, or fulfillment of the continuous reattraction of the already very literate and known, will follow a formula that makes sense across cash flow without us really fully detecting it. And that that following of cash flow, while necessary, can sometimes miss the vital opportunity to grab someone else and carry that cultural moment forward for them through really deeply paying attention to the world as we're living it now. So I think that that is a place that shifts something from being um, uh, the museum's sort of like the permanent collection that's always on display versus the reordering of that so that its mechanism of continuing to be a vital gift lives. So that's in the classical world. In the institutions that do that, I can detect it and feel it. There's a disruption of something and all of a sudden a different composer that's not part of what you often will hear from a major, you know, symphony orchestra is now being put forward. Um, where, where and it's are not you, efficient. Can you name some of the ones so we look out for their programming where you detect that kind of intention? Well, you guys know where the great ones are, and you know where the less than great ones are. And I'm not really of that world, but I can feel it when it attracts and arrests my attention because they also speak about the canon then differently. If there's a choice to do Mozart in a particular time in a particular way with a particular intent and reason, and is it linked to the culture or is it linked to series subscriptions? You can feel the difference if you're not already in that world and probably if you already are. That, all of that aside, um, one of the things that I found, and, I, and, and it's when I was running the Melbourne International Arts Festival, it was a very significant moment. I was an American. I was um, the first in a major, major festival artistic directorial kind of helm. There was a formula that had gone on for 20-some years in which the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, on the closing night of the Melbourne International Arts Festival, historically, bar none, would do the closing night event. And it was really one thing that they didn't put in there standing programming for the population. Um, it was something that they wanted to do and they felt it needed a festival audience. It consumed close to a half a million dollars of the budget of the festival itself. And it was the highest attended and it was a tradition. I wasn't aware of how deep drilling this particular <laughs> tradition was, however, and so when I met with my colleagues, uh, newly uh, arrived, and they were trying to share with me what they were going to program, on my first International Arts Festival programmation, um, I was like, how about if we do something different, which would be, let's find the thing that you can't do without the Melbourne Festival, and the Melbourne Festival can't do with you, without you. And this completely blew their plan out of the water. And that was um, tenuous, I'd say, because their board was powerful, access to government was powerful, a variety of other things so on and so forth. But I knew that it was important because it disrupted a habit that was not now responsive to the aesthetics of the time that we were in in that moment. And, and I'll quicken the story from here. But essentially, what was also bubbling up is that the Melbourne Festival hadn't had a history of working very deeply with um, indigenous artists. And there was a variety of other circumstances that were going on politically at the time in Australia. And so, this group of um, Aboriginal uh, elders and musicians uh, sat down with me, and we realized that there was um, something that we needed to do together. And so what that became was an organization called the Black Arm Band. It was uh, all founded by indigenous artists. And what we did in the first year, and it actually replaced where the Melbourne Festival was in my first festival, um, was 64 different uh, indigenous artists across 
multiple tribes nationwide, uh, and four generations of protest songs. And so they were brought into the symphonic concert hall, and they all performed those songs with their backing band, and it was very impactful. It was timed in such a way that it was leading also to the prime minister's uh, consideration quietly of possibly uh, offering a formal apology to the stolen generation of the Aboriginal people. The Melbourne Symphony Orchestra had clocked this and started taking notes, and they wanted that spot back in the next year. So what I proposed to them in the, let's do something that you can't do without me and I can't do without you. And what we did was we took um, the, the scores of these protest songs from indigenous Australia, and we had them scored by a man named Ian Grandage, because, of course, it's not written in the bass treble clef notation system, et cetera, et cetera. It's learned from the heart and performed through that place. So this was scored, and the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra became the backing band for these songs in a different iteration. It brought the house down. It was the highest attended thing. We had massive amounts of it, but it had the Anglo culture in tears. And the indigenous culture moved to the point of recognizing that they were infecting and, and being brought into a full canon. And the result was at the formal apology, they were reconstituted and brought to parliament to perform on the day of the Stolen Generation's formal apology of Australia. This, to me, was a very significant thing, and the, uh, the symphonic musicians who performed with them, rehearsed with them, and went through you know, cultural sensitivity training and a walkabout and all kinds of things, the way that they then performed the classical canon following the impact of that shifted utterly how much um, indelible integrity was put into each note. So what was politically charged and sensitive, very difficult to manifest, truly embraced, caused huge swaths of change, brought then, it was the Melbourne Symphony with indigenous musicians and composers that then, in the end, received the legacy of that collaboration. It wasn't the symphony, and it wasn't the Melbourne Festival. It was the artistry of that collaboration across very different lines. And that is a way of being awake to the world we're living in, as John Cage says, art's role to be, in which that awakeness had to move a much, a huge dish, distance from the indigenous artists towards the symphony and the symphony towards the indigenous practitioners. And that, to me, becomes part of the effort associated with living the integrity of a purpose through your music beyond what you make a living to but what you also contribute to culture through. Mm -hmm. As one, one example. <laughs> You've done a lot of um, work yourself in communities, artistic projects, um, residencies, and also you have your own training program now. Can you talk a little bit about some of the interesting um, experiences that you had that go kind of deeply into community? Well, I think the one that was really life-changing was one that I did as a grad student first, so before I was a professional, and it colored everything I did after that as a professional. Uh, when I was at Michigan, I started volunteering at a men's prison outside of Detroit, uh, the Gus Harrison Correctional Facilities, and I was working with Latino inmates, and many of them that really felt Latino as opposed to Latino Americano. Perhaps they didn't speak a lot of Spanish, but they had a lot of pride, and this was a group of men that formed a club that wanted to better themselves. And there were advantages when you showed this kind of discipline within the, the correctional system that you would receive visitors from the outside. And so I was the music visitor. And I was going and, and talking about classical music and what Beethoven was trying to do. But then I was trying to play uh, Chavez from Me Mexico or Hinatera from, uh, from Argentina. And, and um, there were a lot of really amazing discussions that came, came out of this. So when I embarked on, a, on the career and I became a freelancer, I'm very nomadic, so I work for a short amount of finite time, and then I'm gone, I'm working with somebody else. I have a lot of different um, short-term employers. And when I go into somebody else's house, they will have certain kinds of needs if I'm their composer in residence. So when I was a composer in residence with a tiny regional orchestra, it might have more to do with the internal infrastructure of the orchestra. So 
they could become better at playing new music, or at the result of having to admin me, <laughs> they hire more people, or they train their interns. It can be something as small as that. But then they may also say, uh, one of our board members uh, was a rape victim when she was young, so she's very into women's issues, and we go into women's prisons, and can we do something with uh, women that are traumatized, maybe they're batter wives or, or whatnot. So sometimes you will just help out with something that's a personal project of somebody very specific within the organizations. Then as the orchestra gets bigger and the city gets bigger, they may have uh, some sort of social situation happening that is bigger and it's not something that's maybe a pet project no matter how, how uh, poignant that might be. So when I started working with Detroit Symphony, you know, their composer and resident, just started shortly after they declared bankruptcy as a city. So we hadn't yet witnessed that. We've, we've seen it in Stockton, California, or some other places, but then Detroit declared bankruptcy. And it's one of our great storied cities, and it has its own Grand Central Station. I mean, it's a magnificent city. And I remember the first time I went there, I said, I'm having this feeling of deja vu. What is it? And I felt like I was in Peru, looking at the, the ruins of the Incas, of these great temples that were paved over. And then you see elements of it poking through. And there's something very proud and something very um, uh, heartbreaking about it. So I have witnessed the city change a lot over the last four years that I was working in Detroit. Every time I came back, it was different. And they had so many constituencies for me to bounce into. So I just have to figure it out. And I have done these one-offs. They're OK. Um, you, you're, you can be surprised. A lot of them have blended through my brain, to be honest. And uh, I'm good in front of a crowd, and I can, I can be very flexible. So sometimes it was just talking to children in, in a school about what you do. And you play something. Maybe I play something. This piece is inspired by Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. What do you know about this? You know, is it scary? So we talk about death, which is good. We talk about celebrating. We talk about Mexican culture. That's always useful. But then, for me, it's when I can have an, an ongoing presence, and I have somebody to maintain that energy on the ground. So when I leave and go back to California, that there's another music teacher there, or there's somebody that can keep that energy going. So I had that in Detroit with a couple of different programs. One was for the first time I, I did some work with uh, the hospitals in Detroit, specifically the music therapist in the children's hospital. And I remember when they first took me on a tour, they had already been traumatized a little bit about classical string quartets playing in a lobby. They got mad when the doctors were rush, rushing off. And I, was like, and I felt embarrassed. I was like, my, my colleagues are behaving badly, you know. And I said, oh my God, you know, you have, that's not the version of yourself that's needed in that moment. So they weren't sure if I was going to be flexible, if I was going to try and write, you know, um, really dissonant cerebral music that was going to be hard for their preemies to listen to. They were telling me that these, these babies born so young or so fragile that I couldn't write music that had intervals greater than a third. And my players couldn't do too much vibrato, no vibrato. It's too much for them. Because they're so fragile that when they, they start, they lose the 30 or 40 calories that it took the past hour to get into their bodies. And I was like, oh my god, talk about parameters for a composer. But it's amazing. With the, with, and then the work that I saw them do, and it was heartbreaking. I, I improvised well, so I, we would sit at keyboards, and we would have these kids come in. And children, they just let go. We remember this when we were just slapping paint on a canvas and we could, you know, up to a certain age, we could still learn languages quick. There's something about this lack of inhibition you have for a little while where they would react to the music making that we were doing and by God, the numbers on their charts would improve. I'd never seen anything like this before. And so that was a very moving experience, you know, having something like that. And then I went and I wrote my big symphony work for Detroit. It doesn't take away from your, your uh, profile as a serious artist. You should be able to walk both walks. And you have a few great artists that are not doubted. Yo-Yo Ma, for instance, you know, is not doubted when he does these kinds of things. But musicians up to that point often fear that they're not going to be taken seriously. And I understand that. And yet you still have to go there. And you still have to just excel in both areas, be a citizen, and, and be really great at what you do. So you mentioned this um, 
school that I've started this year. I've started a small academy up where I live in rural California. I used to live in the Bay Area for many years. I know Metropolis very well. I go in all the time. So we're up in Redwoods and in vineyards, you know, rugged vineyards up in Mendocino County in California. We have a farm, two farms actually. And my idea was to start an academy where emerging composers would come and work with some of my friends that are the best, most wonderful chamber musicians out there. And we would mentor them to death and blow their little mind with, you know, what's not working and what's working. But then we also participate in outreach in this little town of 1100. So I've been teaching a music appreciation 101 course that would probably horrify my music, te my music history teacher because I just do what I want to do. You know, this is, this is what I appreciate in music, you know. But we played a lot of uh, diverse music. So my performers, my composers come and they play and you have this really famous musician playing just 10 feet away from you and taking in your questions. Uh, and I've been bringing in a, a string quartet from uh, San Francisco to read quartets written by the sons and daughters, the Latino sons and daughters of the vineyard workers that are writing quartets. What is it that you want to say? Um, and other farmers, children, and back to the land, hippie kids. Um, so this is important for me, is to give them a beautiful setting, a residency. Uh, I'm a bit of a mother hen, so I feed them really well. And, and, uh, and we talk a lot about how to make a self-determined life work. And if you feel like there's something that you want to do artistically, but also as a citizen in this day and age, how can you make that work? And sometimes they'll remember that. They'll go back to school. They may not be able to put in a lot of time into it, but maybe the memory or the fact that I'm in their corner or these wonderful musicians are in the corner that are twice their age. They can come back and get advice and support. Um, I've got kids coming in um, from Alabama and from Louisiana and from some of these states in middle America that we often talk about losing, whether it's uh, education or politically. And I really want to encourage them to go back to their communities and to do something, start small, but do something and, and teach me, teach me how would it work in a community like this. So, yeah, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wanted to take um, some time to open it up for um, questions. Um, one of the things that I love when I hear Gabriella talk is that she just dreams stuff up and she makes it happen. Um, and I think sometimes um, we look for the structure or the resources or the program that we're going to punch into so that we can do the work that we'd find um, meaningful. Um, and as a side note, um, Scott was telling me about something that Santa Barbara is doing to offering to its alumni, something called the Alumni Enterprise Awards, where basically people can come up with their best ideas and pitch them, and you can get funded up to $20,000 per calendar year. Um, and it's open to anyone who's ever been here. So since 1947, anyone can apply. But the thing that I um, also liked when Scott and I were telling me about it was that um, it's supposed to be something that would promote the Music Academy's mission or your interpretation of that mission. And that mission actually could um, be artistic mission. It could be artistic collaborations that bring in different ideas and different people, different art forms, I, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that kind of um, acknowledgement and funding of, of um, dreams is really, is really mm -hmm. key. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to see if there were questions for our group. And I don't know who has the mic, but yeah. Oh, Jessica has it. He's coming over. She's coming over to you. Hi. Um, so a composer's job is to compose. And um, whatever, whatever the subject matter is, is going to be what's ins what inspires the composer. So if, you, if it becomes political, um, or if it's addressing the issues of the zeitgeist, that is what the composer does. When I was discussing this with John Harbison, he said the first job is to write a good piece. For the presenter, though, what is what is your responsibility, or or as a presenter, what's the responsibility to the constituency? Given that that the performing arts is going to be populated mostly by liberal progressive people, is your responsibility as a presenter to 
um, present your interpretation or your views of what's happening politically, or do you have to balance that, or is there a responsibility to your constituency to be broader and inclusive? How, how do you handle a politically volatile time like the one we're in at the moment? There's a lot of questions in your question. Um, and I can't speak for every single presenter. And usually a presenting organization and its artistic director or executive leadership will be continuously interpreting how they're going to be responsive to a political moment or a cultural condition or a set of circumstances that are going on in the world in relation to what their mission is. So in the context of the center, we're working in every single art form, basically, with a high emphasis on performance. And most of the time, you're also involved in the decision making. Uh, you're, you're standing shoulder to shoulder with an artist or a composer when it's a doodle, doodle on a napkin years before it actually comes to fruition. But what you do find, in my, in my experience, is that the most important political gesture you can make is not to abandon your shoulder to shoulder stance of solidarity with an artist at the moment the work has arrived. And instead, you find the vehicles in which those contexts give voice and light and life to what that artist wanted. And more often than not, it has landed perfectly two years later into exactly the moment we most needed, in my experience. But it wasn't written for that moment. That moment was not anticipated. What I find is that an audience, their lens changes. Um, I mean, abstraction is one of the great examples. You know, there's, uh, there's ways in which, there's chapters in which an abstract art form or an abstract painting can be violently, violently worked against by a public following a certain kind of political or social or war-related catastrophe. We change. And that same abstract painting or that same abstract piece of music, all of a sudden, unlocks a deep poetic inside of us, right? It's uncanny how frequently that happens. When I look at the programming that I'm doing at the center in relation to the here and now, it's not just the work that I'm describing that arrives a couple years after its conception, so on and so forth, but it's also how do I be responsive to the constituents who are there? And they are, in our case, very diverse with much, much, much going on across lots of different musics, lots of different dance, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a way in which the highest compliment that I can give to myself as a curator is that you won't know my personal aesthetic because I have to hold a public mission. I have to uphold a public diversity of other people's aesthetics. There's a way in which, but I also have to make decisions and make choices around both its validity, the caliber of it, the intention of it, a variety of other kinds of things. So it's not that I try to take my aesthetic and lead people to it as an end conclusion. It's that I try and be as expansive to my capacity to listen deeply so that work can arrive for the very distinctive kinds of people and very distinctive kinds of issues that artists are addressing formally, aesthetically, socially, culturally, and politically, and not to avoid making a choice, perhaps, um, that may be uncomfortable in a way. I direct a small chamber music group here, and a couple of years ago, uh, a program that was just performed this April, but it was programmed a couple of years ago, and it opened with a piece by John Harbison called Abu Ghraib, and then two pieces by Michael Doherty, Sing Sing J. Edgar Hoover, and Paul Robeson told me. So it addressed government-sanctioned torture, intrusive overreach, and, and institutional racism. Yeah. Now, two years ago, when I programmed that, it, was, it, would, have been inter, it would have been stimulating an intellectual, an intellectual curiosity. It arrived into the middle of this administration and com became a political hot potato, totally divided my audience. And there was a lot of pushback. So I just, I just wonder, and, and as I'm thinking ahead, I just wonder, what is our responsibility as presenters? I, I don't know. Maybe well, you answered it. it sounds like, I mean, 
there's, we have a lot of responsibilities, many, 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 many different kinds of responsibilities. But it sounds to me that in that example for you, that the responsibility you took in the context of your own leadership was to stay the course and enable that work to move forward to a public, no matter how hot potato that would be, because we are holding a time and place of also, our, our, most of our venues are secular spaces of gathering. Mm -hmm. And where does a secular community find one another in times where lines and divides and discomfort and a variety of other things can cause other modes of disassembly? Staying the course in that case to me is you testifying to taking responsibility for the integrity of what it was that you were putting forward with these artists. To absolve yourself of that and to take an easier road in that time due to timing or whatever else would have been a whole other hot potato, believe me. And I, I think also you would have made a choice that you believe in the work of John Harbison and you believe in the work of Michael Doherty and those artists create work that they're compelled to make and you choose them they create certain work and you give them a platform. It just so happens that a lot of the work, I mean, a lot of work that I sh showed here um, has been, you know, several years in the making or has, it's just that it lands in a different way and maybe it has different implications and maybe it has more of an impact yeah. that's being seen, you know, right now. But I, I think too that it's not exactly right now, because right now is the result of m m many yes. decades of evolution in a variety of, yeah. or devolution, depending on how one might approach their thinking there. But, um, you know, there's also that piece of it that I see happening on a very strong, in a strong way with artists across all disciplines, whether they're commercially successful, whether they're entertainers, whether in the, they're in the avant-garde, whether they're in high levels of academia, et cetera, et cetera. And it is this kind of situation of, I think, an awakeness to recognizing that we have to find the vehicles through which we achieve our solidarity with one another. That the um, way in which we, there's, you know, it's, I, I would tell a story, but I don't have time. Um, there's a place in which we can look at the path of how we make a living. And I think in the arts community, we've allowed ourselves to be segmented across high art, low art, avant-garde, this and that, abstract, full narrative, tidy conclusion, um, sublime in all circumstances, uh, you know, rose-colored glasses, whatever the pursuits are in the context of a culture you're usually arriving towards what it is that you believe folks both need, want, and can bear. So there's an economic pathway that we will knit those things together that sometimes causes us to be slightly at odds or allowed the complacency of the indifference of one another's practices. And now is a time for sure that we are looking at how to be engaged in a solidarity around cause in the world, many different causes, as a community of practitioners in the arts. So it's not as much the idea that, oh, that art museum has tons of money and, and yet we're struggling to pay the symphony, or whatever it is, and that these kinds of things get measured against one another. Our time now is absolutely, and I would say it to any individual artist as well, how you carry the culture forward, especially in times of retraction, is that you find the avenues of your solidarity and you speak through it. And it's not just the way you earn your living, but how you give to the culture at large that is the gesture of how we help one another. Is there another question? Hi, um, I'm with Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra and we did a three week festival that Christy knows quite well in January called Lift Every Voice, um, which just happened to encompass the inauguration, which gave it a, a very different uh, tone than we expected. So um, we, we understand how you feel. Um, what we saw in that and what I'm curious to hear your thoughts about is 
especially in classical music, I think there are quite a few members of the traditional classical audience who come to the concert hall because they want to escape and because they want an experience that's beautiful and sublime. And, and that's what they're there for. And so for a, a more traditional orchestra that's also doing some things that are pushing boundaries, we have to walk the line between satisfying those audience members and people who want something different or something new or something um, that's more of the moment. Do you feel a pressure in, in either of your careers to satisfy that need for escapism or for, yeah, for things that are, that are simple or, or beautiful? Do you feel that? I just want to say before they answer, I do feel that in classical music, generally speaking, there is that want for sublime beauty and escapism and don't um, throw these difficult things at me where I think people who um, seek out kind of um, certain theater or dance or other pieces, I think the appetite is different. And this is from also, you know, working at Lincoln Center for, for many, many years. Um, and I. I do think that the appetite and the expectation is a little bit different. Now, having said that, classical music audiences, there are many classical music audiences, so there's an audience who goes to Loft Opera or National Sawdust or um, sees something at the Ace Hotel, or, and then there's the people who go to the, more, the bigger, more maybe traditional institutions where commissions are a little fewer on the ground and that kind of thing, but it is something that does concern me. I don't present like presenters, but you know, one of the things that you know, I have worked with presenters, and I now kind of feel a little bit of that pain, you know, that in this academy that I've started. So we have an agreement uh, with the local farmers Grange uh, that they're going to give us their wonderful, sweet little dance hall to hear all these premieres of my composer's works. Now, you gotta imagine when you have these young composers now these incredible players that can do anything, they're gonna give them the most rigorous, you know, out of the box music that they can. And so, um, when I was bringing some of this in, just as a, as a trial to my music appreciation course, I had 10, 10 students in there, a couple farmers, a couple vineyard workers, and we had Tony Arnold come in, and she did the burial sequenza. And she did it right in front of them, and you saw like this. But then they felt like they were getting more sophisticated over the eight weeks. And we had a little goodbye potluck, and then one of them came up. He was really worried and said, you know, we're sophisticated now, and we can listen to this, but you may not want to do concerts with just a whole evening of premieres like this. I was like, oh my god, i got to walk the line. But what did it th he had a point, which was they had context. I had played them Bach and Beethoven. I have moved them through the ages. I, when I introduced them to Bartok, who still sounds really challenging and, and gnarly, I played some of Bartok's little piano pieces he wrote as a child. And you heard that kind of rigor and the rhythm. And I said, now look what he did. That's like me on the charango. Right? And they knew that story already. And I said, but this is like when you get invested in Woody Allen. You keep watching all the movies. This is one side of him. This is one. You got to get them invested. And then they can. People with a little bit of information can really listen to gnarly things. This is what I've really you know, come to embrace. But it takes time. It takes time to get their trust. It takes time on the, point, on the part of the person to do some research and to think about the music. And I've, you know, my, my student is right, and what I've decided to do is, and I wanted to anyway, but now I had a real excuse, is I'm making the program smaller. We'll just have like four composers instead, what I thought was gonna be six and seven of each cycle, of each concert, and I'm gonna ask each of my performers, play something you love. We do what you did in the music appreciation course, play some Beethoven or Bach, put it in context, we'll have each of my composers talk, because then you see this kid from Kansas, or you see this young black girl from, from New York, what is it they're trying to do, and you trust them. But it is a, it is a line that I'm just beginning. I've, I have felt it as a composer, and I'm looking at the commissioner, and I'm going, okay, I'm gonna try, your project will make me a better composer because I come out on the other side with skills that I didn't have. I, I wasn't able to write that piece. That's always my perspective. But this unspoken contract is that I'm going to bring your audience to a new place. I'm going to bring your organization to a new place. I'm going to make this a positive experience so that you will fundraise again to commission, to program new art. So 
everybody is thinking about this. Everybody is thinking about this. And I think we're up against a, a, a steep slope where much of music in our society is enjoyed as, you know, I can vacuum, I, can, I just want to relax. I can, even little jazz clubs, which I love and I frequent all the time, I can make noise. You know, I can kind of lean over my husband. I can do those things. I, you know, maybe there's something we can learn from these kinds of settings. Mm. I, I'll just quickly address what you're saying. And, um, <clears throat> you know, do I think that there's a responsibility for, you know, offering people the sublime in a classical chamber orchestra's season? Yeah because that's kind of a lot of what that material does. And do I think it needs to be simple? Absolutely not. That would be the one of the three things you said, and beauty was at the end. So sublime, uh, 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 simple, and beautiful. Well, simple, I would absolutely say no. And the temptation to make it simple is, to me, robbery and an absolute avoidance of the leadership of how you uphold the dignity of the form. And beauty comes in the shape of many different kinds of beholders. So as we know, one person's beauty is somebody else's threat, is somebody else's like bridge too far, the list goes on and on. So there's a lot of fecundity inside of there. I think, and this is how I approach everything, when I'm looking at it, I think to myself, and I learned this from a great theater director, Ariane Manishkin, and she says it to her cast before they perform for the like, the same play for the 400th time that year. And she gets them together before they go on stage, and I think this is worthy of artistic directors, curators, and programmers. She says, there will be somebody in the performance tonight, there will be somebody in the audience tonight in which this is the first time they've been to the theater. This will be their first experience with theater. And there will be somebody in the audience tonight in which it's their last experience with theater. And we have to play for both of them. The body of one can command a lot of influence, and I think that where we shirk our responsibilities is if we decide that we cannot possibly bear to make one human being of influence socially uncomfortable at intermission for 30 seconds. And so a year prior to that moment happening, we make a different decision. And therefore, we forfeit the ability for that individual to also be stretched soulfully and differently in their relationship to a journey that we're taking them on. I think maybe we have time for one more question. Do you want to just shout it out? Yeah, shout it out. yeah, um, and I'll repeat it. I think a lot of, uh, just to, to your point, do you want to read it? Uh, okay. If it's short and pithy, we can respond. Okay. Um, Hi, I guess to, to your point, a lot of the responsibility is also, for example, in the conductors. Um, Beethoven's Emperor comes to mind, and Beethoven's The Eroica, which, and all the things that were then politically changed to reflect the, the, the protest of the composer, but just one point, when on the election day, KUSC wanted, pulled their listeners and wanted to know who want, what was the most requested uh, uh, piece, and it was Mozart's Requiem. So there is a lot of pushback, s subtly, I guess, would be, and that's, that's the only point I wanted to, to make. Um, Jessica said we have time for one more question. Yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, that would have been. Um, yeah. I, I just want to say that you, the, all three of you have given me so much courage today, and I feel inspired. I'm a first time producer of a documentary film trilogy about Beethoven, and um, you know, Gabriella, <laughs> you're gonna really love this. Um, the, the current one we're working on um, was, has been, we filmed it down in Chile with the local musicians, and we semi-staged Beethoven's only opera, Fidelio. And we're um, trying to make it relevant, which it is, more and more to what is happening in our world today. Um, it's the footage we have, it gives me chills, it's so exquisitely beautiful, it's unbelievable. And I'm working with such a gifted director and videographer, and um, so 
Anyway, I'm, I'm just so glad I came today. You, all three of you have been really helpful for me. I took a lot of notes. So um, thank you so much. And if you have any suggestions or um, we have all our footage, we're in post-production with editing, and, and mm -hmm. it's very challenging. Well, mm. You know, the first time I heard Beethoven in Ecuador, it was with those musicians. And they have a band of 38 players, so instead of the violins, they have um, cana flutes. And then the violas are all these pan pipes that they invented to look like the piano keyboard. So you have the black notes in the front row and the white notes in the back row. Because they wanted to play classical music with certain kinds of harmonies. And it was this video that this young Ecuadorian had shown me. And they're getting ready, and the conductor's like getting them started. And the first thing I hear is, toot, 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 toot. <laughs> And then they just exploded. And you know, still the little pelitos, the little arm hairs in my, in my arms just go like this to think about it. Because it, it was so deep, that moment. I was just imagining how they reached across the cultural divide to grab at Beethoven, and they loved it, and they played it like their own. They had no problem with rearranging it, inventing instruments. It, they were going to eat that music no matter what. It was something that was meaningful. And we have to work from that spirit. It can look like a lot of different things. But yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Well, thanks for using the word courage. I would use that to apply to both of what you do. And one of the really great things for me talking to you both before this panel was to hear how much optimism you have about young people and about the future. Um, and Christy, you said to me, young people have a lot of agency. And I think you know when you talk about these things and what people what lives people can live who are classical musicians or any kind of artist, they can invent what we come to be known as the, you know, as the norm or something, uh, something beautiful that we can only imagine right now. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.